Committee, I declare the meeting open to the public. Can I advise members that uh, they are welcome to use Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. Can I inform members the revised draft agenda was circulated. The revision is due to an urgent SL1 on the business tendencies, coronavirus restrictions on forfeiture, relevant period Northern Ireland number three regulations. 2020. Uh, can uh, I seek? Sorry, yeah, Pat. Sorry, just a wee message there, for, uh, Jim Wells. I don't know if you've seen him. He's in a, a meeting at the moment with the health union, so he'll be here as soon as possible. Okay, we'll come to that. Just two ticks. Uh, can I seek agreement if members are content to proceed with the revised agenda? Okay, content. Okay, I, if members are content, we'll proceed through the agenda. First is apologies. Uh, again, as Pat said, Jim Wells could be late and will be late. And also, Jim Alster is in the audit committee, uh, and will join uh, after that. And of course, then the chairperson himself, uh, Steve. Uh, any other members uh, have any apologies? I think that's covered everyone. I have to leave at three, but only for ten minutes. Okay. Are you going to an all-party work group, Pat? Are you? If you I, are, could you? I, uh, I was. For construction. Yes. If you are, could you put an apology in for me? Because okay. obviously I'll not be. I'll only be. I'll only be in and out of it. It's just because it's the AGM today. I'll that? not be able to be. I'll put an apology in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Can I ask the clerk then if notice has been received from any member who has delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote under temporary standing order one one five six? I'm sure we received notification that um, Jim Allister has delegated a vote to Jim Wells. Okay. Depending on timing, and also Gemma had advised us that um, she may need to leave early, and had delegated her authority to Melissa. Okay. At least you have enough for that, then, yeah. yeah. You have enough for that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the fellow handle that. <laughs> okay. Uh, no other apologies then. Uh, the declaration of interest. Can I remind members they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest of each committee meeting as applicable, if not at the start, certainly through the agenda, if they find. There's something there of interest. Okay, members, moving on. Draft minutes of proceedings of the 2nd of September, December sorry, 2020. Can I inform members that draft minutes of the meeting on that date are at page 7? There's a small change. Can I ask the clerk? To sure, thank you, Chair. Um, there's a minor um, issue with the date in the draft minutes. So it's on page 8, and under draft minutes, it talks about Wednesday, the 2nd of December, um, whereas it should say the, the 25th of November. Just a minor date change to be, be put into, into there. Okay, you've all heard that, members. Can I ask members if they're content that the draft minutes are an accurate recording of the proceedings? Mm -hmm. If agreed, the minutes will be published on the website. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Thank you, members. Matters arising. I have no matters arising. Any other members? Okay, moving on. Uh, oral evidence then, the consultation amending the building regulations Northern Ireland 2012, the oral evidence of the Department of Finance consultation summary. And I remind members this session is being recorded by Hansard. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing, so hopefully it's going to be working okay. Could I welcome uh, to the committee Billy Black, Head of Building Standards Branch Principal Professional Technical Officer, and Damien Barley, if I've got that right, hopefully. Building Standards Branch Senior Professional Technical Officer. You're very welcome to the meeting. We can get both of you on the screen. Yep. Uh, you're very welcome to the committee meeting. Thank you very much. I'm standing in for the chair, just in case you think the chair has uh, done something with his hair. Um, and uh, he can't make it today, so... Uh, you're stuck with me as chair. So thank you very much, Billy and Damien, for attending here today on what we class as a very serious subject. Uh, and of course, the consultation that's on, that has been ongoing. Uh, so without further, uh, can I just, before I do that, can I just inform members the following papers are relevant to this agenda item are the clerk's brief at page 15, the department brief summary of consultation at page 19, and the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service Parliamentary Bulletin at page 74. If all members are content, then I'm going to ask Mr Black to make an opening statement to the committee, if that's OK, Mr Black. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, uh, Chair and members. Um, uh, I'll start by saying that um, 
My name is Billy Black. I'm here with my colleague Damien Furley to provide oral evidence to the committee in relation to the recent consultation on the proposed amendments to the building regulations, Northern Ireland 2012. Damien and I work in the department's building standards branch, which has responsibility for several pieces of building regulations related legislation. Notably, most relevant, the building regulations Northern Ireland 2012 as amended. Um, that's the, um, the proposed consultation is on that amending that particular statutory rule. And then the building prescribed fees uh, regulations in Northern Ireland, um, which is uh, about the fees that are enabled to be charged by the district councils for providing building control services. Um, these both these statutory rules were made under the powers conferred by the building regulations Northern Ireland Order 1979, which is the primary legislation applicable. Um, and um, currently as acting head of building standards branch, I'm carrying out an overall management role across the branch's three units. Damien is currently managing building regulations unit one, which has responsibility for a number of parts of the building regulations, including fire safety and rating, which are matters which are considered in the consultation. Uh, we have provided uh, a briefing document, a summary of responses for the DOF Assembly Committee for the committee to consider. The document contains uh, a briefing in the executive summary and the background and introduction to the proposals section. Um, by way of some just further background, um, a building regulations work program was agreed in December uh, 2019 at the same time that the local building regulations advisory committee, NIBRAC, was being re-established. NIBRAC continues to exist under Article 4 of the 1979 order to advise the department upon the amending of building regulations and upon any matter arising out of or connected with the amendment or operation of building regulations, which may be referred to it by the department. The work program was to be implemented through a number of amending statutory rules with fire safety matters um, relating to an effective ban on combustible materials, assessment in lieu of tests, and rate on issues being prioritized in the first SR. Work started with Redbrush and its technical subcommittee in January 2020 and the proposals were scoped out and, this, and uh, are the subject of this consultation, which opened on the 14th of August, closing on the 9th of October. Um, the branch welcomes the views of the committee, which together with the consultation responses will be brought back to NIBRAC to inform the next phase of the consultation analysis. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, Billy, for that. Uh, Damon, do you want to add in at this point, or will we go straight into questions? Just maybe to give you a brief overview of the responses to the consultation. Um, there was a total of 43 responses received by the department, 42 of those of a technical nature and one which was not technical. The breakdown of those 42 responses, and this is all in the report that we sent you, but anyway, um, 11 were from the district councils. 24 were from the industry, mainly made up of product manufacturers and their associations. Five were from professional bodies, including the RSUA, RICS, CABE, CIAT, and the Institute for Town Planners. One response was received from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, and one was received from the Fire Brigade Union in London. Um, the two major points that came out of the consultation um, the first major point was um, the use of the large-scale BS8414 test. Under the proposed new regulation, 23.2 in Part B of the building regulations, um, the materials used in external walls of relevant buildings will have to achieve A1 or A2S1 D0 performance classification. Combustible products cannot achieve that classification. 
and hence cannot be used on relevant buildings on the external walls. Um, compostable materials can pass the large scale BS8414 test when in combination with other suitable materials. Um, quite a proportion of the respondents were not happy with the new regulation um, and wanted the BS8414 test to be acceptable in all situations. So what we're proposing is to allow the 8414 test for non-relevant buildings above 18 metres. But in terms of relevant buildings, which we see as the higher risks, such as blocks of flats, hospitals, care homes, nursing homes, student accommodation, all with a floor over 18 metres, we're saying that the only route to compliance for those buildings is to fit non-combustible materials of either A1 or limited combustible materials of A2, S1, D0 classification. The BS8414 route to compliance will not be allowed for those buildings. The other major issue uh, coming out of the consultation was um, the guidance that we propose in technical booklet E for non-relevant buildings. Um, we tried to put a paragraph in to re-emphasize the people that Regulation 36, which deals with the external fire spread requirements, applies to buildings of all heights and not just those over 18 meters in height. Um, since Grenfell, there's been this perception that it only applies to high-rise buildings over that height, and that's not the case. There was a serious fire this time last year in Bolton, student accommodation, and the upper the top story height was 17.8 meters. It was just below the 18 meters threshold, but it was wrapped in a cladding material of highly flammable H HPL panels. So the, the Fire and Rescue Service and the District Councils in their responses to us as part of the consultation have made it clear that they're not happy with the guidance that we're proposing on that. And what they would rather see is specific performance classifications specified below 18 metres in the same way that they're specified for buildings over 18 metres. So there are the two major issues coming out of the consultation from our point of view. Um, there is a lot of other little bits and pieces, but um, I think there are the two main points that we'd like to get across to you today that we need to address. Thank you. Okay, Damien, thank you very much. Uh, I think you, you, you've, hit, uh, you've hit the issue with regards to the, the, the ban on combustible materials and then the, the argument for the BS8414 test, which a lot of the, some of the respondents have not, uh, come through with saying that they would be in favour of the large scale testing to assess the performance of the external cladding in its entirety. Um, but you're clearly saying that if they were, if that was tested, even on a large scale, if the material was tested on a large scale setting or rig without any of the other material that would surround it in the belt form, that the, the material would fail those tests too? Is that yeah. what you're saying? So, so. There, there is the possibility that if it's combined with other products or materials of a combustible nature, that it, it will fail. But there is the possibility that it will pass the 8414 test if it's combined with other materials of a non-combustible nature or a limited combustible nature. So it all depends what it's combined with. But that, that is the nature of the 8414 test. It is a, a large scale test, which tests the combination of materials as opposed to the small scale tests, which tests the materials in isolation. So, and, and realizing this is a very serious issue and where, and, and you know, the, the whole consultation has occurred because of deaths and, and horrendous situations that have led to deaths. What what is actually wrong with testing a material alongside other materials that would be used alongside that in the belt form? And is that not still is that not still a way of providing fireproofing and testing what would be the belt form? 
There's there's nothing wrong with it. It it, it it's the eight four one four test is an honest test with the intentions of demonstrating to you how products perform when in, when in combination. Um, as far as we're concerned, there's nothing wrong with the eight four one four test. Um, it is it is a robust test. It's used all around the world. Um, when I mean whenever I say that it's ro robust, what I'm hinting at there is that um, the wooden crib that's used as the fuel source generates a 4.5 megawatt fire, which is more than adequate. Um, the height of the wall is nine meters high, which is higher than any other test of a similar nature that's used around the world. Um, the performance criteria to pass the test, which is set in BR135, um, are quite stringent, and hence the reason why people, well, some, some people feel the need to cheat for to pass the test, because the performance criteria is so stringent. Um, we have two issues with the test and the first one is the major one. It's a widely held view that what is built on site never replicates what is tested in the laboratory. Um, it is very, very rare that, I mean, it only takes someone to deviate away from what has been tested in the laboratory to using different fixing screws that renders that test null and void. Um, what has to be built on site has to replicate the test precisely down to the last screw that is fitted. Um, which is a problem because we all know what goes on on construction sites on a Friday afternoon when the guys are rushing to get things done and are told just, just put that up. They will lift the nearest tools to them and, and fit something without the proper measures in, in place. Um, that's the major concern that we have with it. The other concern is the recent revelations from the public inquiry in the Grenfell that people are manipulating the test and the results from it, but that doesn't take away from the nature of the test. As far as we're concerned, it is, it is a robust test and testing things in combination is a good test. Um, in the context of testing, because you know, testing has its limitations also. There's no test, whether small scale or large scale, can replicate a real fire scenario. Um, tests are used to, to compare how products perform in the test conditions. Test conditions are never replicated in the real fire scenario. It's a bit like Boeing testing jet engines on the ground for hundreds of hours. Once you put them up in the air, it's a totally different ballgame in terms of the conditions, etc. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. It's very informative. Uh, so you, I, I hear what you say with regards to the building site. I was on it for 20 years myself, so I, I get that. But again, the, the stories that I could tell and the stories that you could tell are quite anecdotal. Is, is there... Is there is there real science data around that, or is it just the fact that we've, we 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 cannot determine or prove that the tests are as are being held as rigorously as possible? And I, I get the point with every screw needs to be in its same place as it would be replicated on the side of a building. Uh, and and how how could you go about how could you go about adding rigor and certificate certification to that test? to make it more authentic and to make it more uh, reliable? You could argue it's a role for enforcement. Um, and in Northern Ireland, that responsibility falls to the district councils, but they, they can't be on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You, you really have to put the onus on to the, the people who are carrying out the work. So, so the contractors, the designers, the building owners have to be made responsible for what is built on their sites. Um, at the minute, you know, there's there, there's talk of major change to the construction industry through the Hackett recommendations over in England. Um, but until we arrive at that point where there's 
checks and balances put into place, I'm, I'm not so sure about trusting the outcome and the application of the 8414 test. But the test itself, I reiterate again, is a good, honest, robust test for the testing of materials in combination. So some of the presenters here to this committee have suggested that if it was independently run, if the tests were independently run by, by a, a tester, a uh, test body, and they cited a couple of places in Northern Ireland where this was rolling out or was being held, and they were truly accredited, <coughs> Would that install confidence in the department that that would be done complete and, and properly? I'm not too sure about that, Chair. Um, our understanding of the large-scale tests, and this, this may sound a bit strange, is um, certainly the ones that occurred with BRE and Celatex over in England, the actual wall that is tested is built by the test sponsor as opposed to the test house, which is carrying out the test. And the test sponsor, which is the product manufacturer, basically tells the test sponsor what they've built. So there's an element of trust there before the like of BRE carries out a large scale test. But there is a lot of validity in these test houses being UCAS accredited because they, they are then audited in terms of their procedures. Um, from the department's point of view, you know, we put a lot of onus on U, UCAS accreditation. So um, I don't know whether Billy would want to maybe comment further on that in terms of how the department feels about it. Yes, um, sure. Um, the, um, it, it boils down to, as Damien has said, is the, the trust in the actual test. And in England at the minute, uh, they are uh, bringing in a new regulatory regime. So they're bringing in a building safety regulator specifically under the health and safety executive. And they're changing the way um, the regulatory regime works so that um, uh, they, they will have a separate regime for high rise, these high rise, high risk buildings. Um, and there'll be a focus on things like competence of designers and obviously building control, building control officers and um, approved building control bodies. Um, so that the, let's say the risk of the system being gained or for misunderstandings within the system will be reduced. Now when England do that, it would be interesting to see if they would roll back from the ban that they introduced in 2018. And um, my uh, talking to the Ministry of Housing, uh, Communities and Local Government, um, they have um, actually reviewed the ban. Um, and the, I think the submission on that is again with the ministers at the minute. So we are again waiting to see what the results of the review of the ban in England. So that did, um, uh, you may be aware as well, that what that did was that it considered a reduction in height from 18 to 11 metres and also uh, uh, widening the scope of relevant buildings to include hotels and um, some other buildings. Um, so it would be interesting to see what that position would be um, you know, and, and that's probably going to be considered in the totality of, you know, the public inquiry um, and the, the work that's moving forward on the Hackett recommendations. Can I ask then, does building control... <laughs> can I ask, does building control have a role in ensuring that what was built complies with specifications with regards to testing? Building control would tend to accept the documentation that is received um, and sent to them by the people who are installing it. If, if there's appropriate certification, um, they will take that certification documents on, on board and that will be their way of assessing whether it's been built appropriately or not. Okay, thank you very much. And, and meets for the test. Okay, I'll hand, out, I'll hand over to members then. Uh, Philip McGregor. Thank you. 
Uh, and thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, it was actually very, very useful. Halfway through it, I was beginning to scratch my head when you were talking about how, how good the test was uh, when, I, when I indicated to speak. And then you, you obviously clarified uh, that the test is very good. It's the application uh, on site that's, that's less good. Uh, I mean, I, I would probably take a different tone than the chair. Uh, it's not anecdotal. I mean, we're hearing uh, from the inquiry and revelations and emails that it goes much further than, the, than anecdotal uh, in terms of some of the, the things that happen on site. So, you were saying that, uh, I mean, the test can happen and can be perfect, and then it, on site, even down to screws or fixings, can have an impact on it. We kind of heard the converse view last week from some of the industry uh, representatives, and I, I hope I get it right because it, it's a bit complicated. They, they, they seem to be saying that the test for combustible, combustible materials or non-combustible materials, w w the tests were done in such small quantities that there was no guarantee that if something tested as non-combustible that then combined with other materials that that uh, would again still be the result. So, I mean, I think I'm quoting them correctly in terms of, of what they were saying. So I think it would be interesting to hear your viewpoint on that. And then just a second point, that, you know, we're talking here about what's happening in, in England and Wales and then uh, what's happening in Scotland. But a lot of the builders, and uh, construction companies uh, and the, the firms that make these materials on this island probably either work close to the border or, or they're building north and south. So it would be interesting to know just in terms of the regulations in the south, uh, you know how, how they will, how they are at the minute, and the impact on that. Well, the building regulations and the guidance in the south is exactly where we're at at the minute prior to these changes. So, for buildings above eighteen meters in height, they require the products to be of limited combustibility, of a class A two, S two, D three. Um, it's important to realise that within the class of A2, which is the limited combustibility class, there are nine different categories, ranging from A2, S1, D0, down to A2, S2, D3. Now, the difference between the nine is the amount of smoke production and flaming droplets during the small-scale tests. So what we're specifying for relevant buildings is the highest limited combustibility class of A2, S1, D0. Um, we're not aware of any situation where a combination of either A1 or A2, S1, D0 products have failed the BS8414 test. I, I got an inclination last week that the contributors were indicating that there are examples where A, A2 materials, limited combustibility products, have actually failed the large scale BS8414 test as if it's a more onerous test. I get a sense that what they're pointing to is the other categories of A2 products as opposed to the A2 S1 D0, the highest class of product within the A2 range. So um, we're not aware, in, in the context of your first question about testing in relation to um, non-combustible products failing the, the BS8414 test, we're not aware of any combination failing that test. Um, and in relation to down, to down south, as I say, they're, they're in the same position as ourselves now. Um, and you could argue that we don't have the density of high-rise buildings here to be affected like what England and South Wales has. But um, we did come under pressure to do something regarding this matter. Um, and we felt the most appropriate way to go was, was, was to follow what England and Wales had actually brought in. Okay, so just in your last point then, so you're obviously everybody quite rightly come under pressure after Grenfell uh, to take a look at this. But in terms of what you're saying, you're confident that this isn't some kind of knee-jerk reaction to pressure. This is actually something that, a sensible approach that will make buildings safer, obviously, for the people who inhabit them. 
whether we take the England and Wales approach or whether we follow the Scottish approach, both approaches make buildings safer because you're increasing the performance classifications that are for the materials to be used on the external walls of buildings. Um, our view is, I think there's a balanced approach to be had here in introducing the ban for relevant buildings only and allowing the BS8414 large scale test for other non-relevant buildings. Okay, go on but both approaches are making buildings safer. Okay. Sure. Oh, go ahead. Uh, if I could make a point there, um, we, we are talking about uh, testing here, but as I mentioned uh, in my uh, opening comments, there's also what's known as assessments in lieu of tests or desktop studies. And there was a perception that what was happening across these islands in the past was that the system was being gamed. So in effect, what happened was you tested um, a particular makeup of system and then somebody was paid to do a desktop exercise and decided, well, we'll swap that bit out and we'll put that insulation in. We'll swap that screw out and we'll put this screw in. And um, there, there, there is a, a movement now um, and within our proposals to ensure that that's tightened up on. So there's now a new standard out to um, govern and um, uh, to, to let um, people be aware what it is appropriate to swap out and what it's not appropriate to swap out. So the danger could have been in the past um, as well as um, um, a problem with construction on site, an actual test being gamed in the sense that what uh, you were provided with was a test certificate and then an assessment in lieu of test that says, Although this is not exactly the same as what was tested, but it's okay anyway. And that was 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 extremely, um, I think, uh, a, a dangerous situation. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Thank McHugh. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, are very welcome here this evening too, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, again, too, in relation to uh, testing and so on, um, it must be very very difficult to have what would be truly an independent test. Uh, in fact, uh, at our meeting last week, we heard a lot about testing, uh, and yet, at the same time, whenever some companies not had the results of testing, they still choose to uh, ignore them, uh, and, 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 and eventually would have put people's lives in that at risk. Uh, and I know that whenever you talk about uh, replicating a situation, I find it very difficult how one could actually replicate a location uh, depend entirely then on the height of the building and so on, where location in itself would give rise to sort of conditions in that that could, um, uh, if anything, uh, help uh, and encourage, we'll say, uh, combustible materials to sort of uh, really take over the building in many ways. Um, so that, um, how do you actually feel about that uh, as well too, in relation to testing? Uh, and is it the case of uh, saying, well, uh, testing in itself is so imperfect in many ways that really the safest route for uh, us to adopt is one that whereby we actually uh, put a blanket ban on combustible materials. Yeah, there's an argument for that. Um, as I said earlier, t testing is, is not intended to, to simulate a specific rail fire. Um, they are simply a means to compare the performance of one product with another product in the same test conditions. Um, and by setting this type of benchmark, um, it eliminates products that are manifestly not safe in the first place. The small scale tests, which, which the A1 and A2 classifications will be based on, are used around the world. They're not just European standard tests, they're, they also have the ISO recognition to them. Um, so there is an element of safety and comfort blanket to them that if you introduce the ban on the higher risk relevant buildings, what you're saying is the only products that you can use bar, bar the, the exemption list is uh, products that are A1 or A2, S1, D0. But you're right, testing is an imperfect way 
of guaranteeing safety, but it's the only way that is available to us. Uh, and and this Chair, if I could just add to that, um, the issue with testing is that you've always got a tension there between um, how um, repeatable the test is, so it needs to be able to be repeated, um, so that uh, numbers of tests can be achieved, and how representative it is of the real life situation. So this is right across. Um, you find the, the whole of society. I worked in the aircraft industry before and uh, the simulated bird strikes on aircraft wings uh, and the test believe it or not was firing dead birds or dead chickens um, at the wings of planes and, and, and it was repeatable and it was representative. Um, how representative it is, uh, that is the question. Um, so it's about how, in my opinion, how representative the test is. Uh, well, in addition to that, has any consideration been given to the uh, economic consequences uh, on the construction industry uh, in relation to either uh, the use of the testing and its conclusions and whether they're implemented or not, and or uh, the use of non-combustible materials, which apparently uh, are not that easily acceptable uh, currently here on the island of Ireland? Our impact assessment um, estimated that this would impact on three buildings per year in Northern Ireland. Um, we didn't see that as a big impact in terms of affecting the industry. Um, I have heard comments from those saying that yes, but it will be applied to a broader range of buildings than those of being relevant buildings. Um, that's always been the way with building regulations. Building regulations set minimum standards for life safety purposes. If people out there choose to, to apply the regulations to a broader range of buildings than what it actually applies to, that's their choice to do so. And they may be doing it for very good reasons, for property protection reasons, such as the insurance industry. So, um, but as I say, building regulations are set for minimum standards only um, and the impact of this if applied at a height of 18 meters in northern ireland would affect three buildings per year so it's a low impact yeah. and just in conclusion uh you mentioned the height of 18 meters and that this is a recommendation by the fire service themselves that we're talking here about 11 meters because that's uh, the only height that they can effectively uh, tackle uh, a fire. Yeah, that's a critical comment for us. Um, some people think all of the responses at consultation count the same, and it's a game of numbers. But um, for us, what the Fire and Rescue Service says matters a lot to us. So if they're the only people who actually fight fires, the rest of us just talk about this stuff. Um, so when the Fire and Rescue Service say to us that 11 metres should be the upper threshold height, because above that height, we have issues with external firefighting techniques. Um, we have to take that on board and consider it very seriously. And I agree with you entirely on that. Thank you, Chair. Gemma uh, Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Billy and Damien. Um, and following on at talking about the Fire and Rescue Service, um, they raise concerns about the decision not to include um, hotels and hostels within the scope of the van. Um, is, this, is this what you're saying is the minimum? Um, recommendations or what was the rationale for excluding these buildings and the other question I have is the ban only affects new buildings or buildings that have been repurposed and um, why was the legislation not retrospective to include all relevant buildings does that mean now that some buildings present a high risk um, the first part of your question in relation to hotels hostels and boarding houses um, they have a sleeping risk within them in the same way domestic type buildings have, but they are a more managed type of premises with a different evacuation strategy employed. So um, there was a lot of reasons, uh, I'll just go through. Um, a lot of people argued that they're, that, that they're buildings of less risk, they're a more managed type of premises subject to fire safety legislation, which involves fire risk assessments, which the Fire and Rescue Service are the enforcing body on. 
Um, the evacuation strategies in hotels, hostels and boarding houses is different. They're well managed with full fire alarm systems, good signage, 24 hour reception. So someone is always awake to raise the alarm. Um, they don't have a stay put policy, which is in play in a lot of domestic type residential um, blocks of flats. And also um, under the guidance changes, there will be a minimum performance classification of A2S2D3, which is a limited combustibility class for the materials, including the cladding and insulation used on these buildings over 18 meters in height. And lastly, the Home Office statistics indicated that the deaths in domestic residential type buildings are three times higher than those in other residential type buildings with a sleeping risk, such as hotels. So that was the reason for, for excluding them. Now, we have asked the question as part of the consultation, do people feel that they should be included? And the, the responses to that have pretty much indicated an even split of those in favour of them being included within the scope of the ban and those arguing for them to be kept out of the ban. So um, it's one of these ones that we need to take back to NIBRAC and the technical subcommittee and discuss with them. Again, the Fire and Rescue Service comment on that will carry a lot of weight. Um, in the contact, the second part of your question was about applying the ban retrospectively to um, existing buildings. That, 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 that's not within the gift of building regulations. There's a common misunderstanding that building regulations apply to buildings and um, they don't <laughs> they actually apply to building work so um, building regulations only kick in whenever you're carrying out building work which is the erection of a new build the extension of an existing building alterations to an existing building or where a building goes through a material change of use so that's why we can't apply it retrospectively it's not within our gift okay thank you are there any other members who want to come in on this? Sorry, Pat, Pat of course. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, thanks very much, Billy and Damien. Um, I was just wondering on the response. Uh, if there's concerns on the time allowed for the, the look at these new regulations and the training for professionals for, and if they do come in on the proposed changes, do you have, uh, or does the department come to a view on whether or not there's enough time uh, are the time is sufficient or whether there's an necessity to have an extended period? Yeah, we, um, due to the seriousness of this matter, Pat, we, 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 were try, we were thinking of making a statutory rule at the end of this year and trying to bring it in within three months after that. But given the nature of the responses and the complexity of them, we need to go back to the NIBRAC um, and the technical subgroup to, to discuss most of these matters. Um, two of the respondees, the, the Construction Employers Federation and the National House Building Council, pointed out to us that we would need to have a longer lead in time between making the law and bringing it into operation than what we had planned. So they were putting it to us that it should be at least six months. Um, again, that's something that we need to think about and discuss with the technical subgroup of. Uh, Part E, fire, fire safety. Um, what was the other aspect to your question? Sorry. Well, was... You probably covered that there. It was just on the time to, you know, would we ex ex extend that time in order for professional people that were trying to monitor this to give them more time to train? So probably you've answered it within what you've said. But to add a little bit to it, uh, Damien or to Billy, um, I know that. But, but we have, you've looked at England and Wales. Could it, or did you think of tailoring it in such a way that it was Northern Ireland based? I know, was there, is there a, a case to be made for to tailor these regulations for, let's call it our own home based market here within Northern Ireland? Mm -hmm. There is, yes. Um, building regulations is a devolved matter. Um, I mean, you're free to make whatever regulations and guidance that you wish for the citizens of Northern Ireland here. Um, there's nothing in the rule book that says that we have to follow what England and Wales or Scotland do. 
Um, what we do do from the early 1970s when building regulations was first brought in is we rely heavily on the research that um, our counterparts in England carry out. They actually spend a lot of money on research for the base these changes on evidence. And we use that evidence to make similar, if not the same changes, to make similar changes for, for here. So if, if you want to deviate away from that, and go off and do your own thing. It may leave you a little bit exposed in the future if England decide to change something again that you can't then follow because you're not in the same position to follow them. Just, type of thing. Just, I mean, why then? Why not? I mean, then we should have looked. At, I'm, I'm sure you did look at the best. But my question backward: Why follow? Why not go to Scotland? You know, what's what's when when you measure them? Why not just take them from Scotland rather than just taking them from England or from Wales? I mean, there has to be a reason. I mean, is, are you saying one's better, or what's what's the model in Scotland? Well, Scotland have gone down the guidance approach and allowed the BS eight four one four test for all buildings. But what we're hearing is they're going to look at that again. So there, there's no guarantee that Scotland are going to stick one, with the current position that they're in. And the minister over there is coming under huge pressure from MSPs and the media, etc., for the introduce a similar ban that's in England and Wales. But there's nothing to stop us following what, what England do also. There's nothing in the rule book that says that we have to follow what England does. Wales, Wales tends to follow what England does, and so have we traditionally since the introduction of building regulations in the 1970s. I don't know if Billy wants to comment further on that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, what what we do is um, we, we try to use England as a as a starter for ten, and then we consider it in the local context. And um, so, for instance, in the past, there have been occasions when we have examined particular proposals that have been um, due to come in in England. And for instance, the council's building control or the Fire and Rescue Service were uncomfortable with them and therefore we haven't implemented them here. Uh, they tend to be sort of um, not strategic differences, but smaller differences. Um, I was looking at the regulations in the Republic of Ireland today, and they're actual, our, our part E here, Fire Safety is England's uh, part uh, uh, B, and it's also part B down south, so in a sense, in the south, they actually reflect slightly more in line with what uh, England and Wales would have than, than we would have in terms of their structure of their regulations. I can't really say that about the content. Um, but for instance, England are going through their buildings, um, the regulations advisory committee are going to um, examine, they're going to review, uh, now carry out a complete review of their fire safety guidance and um, uh, they have commissioned a number of research projects. One of them includes um, um, a research project about the what we were talking earlier on about the heights. Um, so for instance, we would be able to pick on up that up on that research and then he discuss it locally here. Um, and when we discuss it with NIBRAC, we're discussing it with a technical subcommittee that includes um, the uh, council building control includes the fire and rescue service and includes the housing executive. Um, um, you know, so it includes key stakeholders um, that deal with fire safety in the province. One example of that, Pat, would be um, in dwelling houses here, we require a higher fire alarm standard than is asked for in England. So in England, they ask, in a, typical dwelling house um, smoke detection in the circulation area uh, and that's it. Whereas here we ask for smoke detection in the circulation area, smoke detection in the principal habitable room, your main living room and a heat detector in the kitchen. And that came about through us taking the England product and putting it through the NIBRAC and consultation process here. And we decided here to apply a higher standard. <clears throat> Okay, no more, no further uh, questions from the committee here today. So, Holly and Damien, thank you very much for your time and your, your answers to our questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All Thank the best. You, Chair. Okay, members, moving on. Yep, Pat, that's fine. Yep, you've recorded your apology. Yep. Moving on then to uh, item number six, uh, written brief from RAISE, the review of financial uh, process select reading list for the Committee for Finance. Can I inform members the RAISE briefing paper of the select reading list is included in papers at page 79. Can I advise members that this briefing note from RAISE provides a select reading list of past reports, discussion papers, briefings, minutes and correspondence which are relevant to the Department of Finance review of financial process in Northern Ireland. Okay, members content? Keep us Any going comments? Over Christmas, Chair. Say again, sir. Keep us going over Christmas. Absolutely. Good Christmas reading there. Absolutely. Uh, seek agreement to note. Okay. Uh, item number seven then, is the written evidence from the Department of Finance on the Procu Public Procurement Common Framework. I inform members the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. Update from the Department on the ongoing work to establish a common framework for public procurement across the UK. Come into effect from 1st of January 2021. It's page 84. The draft outline framework agreement at page 86. The response from the Construction Employers Federation uh, to construction and procurement delivery regarding the common framework policy uh, at page 98. And a copy of the summary framework which has been provided to the committee by the Construction Employers Federation at page 104. There's a backstory to this, members, if you uh, indulge me for one moment. Uh, the Department has acknowledged that the framework process is now at phase four. However, Cabinet Office has issued scrutiny guidance uh, to devolve this administrator's uh, stating that legislators must be provided with a summary framework document at Phase 3. The Department did not provide the summary to this committee. The committee received it from CEFNI. The correspondence from CEF indicates that the summary framework was issued on the 22nd of October. Uh, if the Cabinet Office guidance had been followed, it should have been issued to this committee at the same time with the offer of a technical briefing. Uh, so the department's approach, now if you bear in mind that the committee has up to 21 sitting days to scrutinise the framework from receipt of the outline framework, the department's approach represents a significant deviation from cabinet office guidance resulting in a six week delay in providing the relevant information to this committee. Uh, can I ask members if there are any comments at this stage, and then I'll go on with what I think the committee should seek. Anyone want to? Have we, have we had any explanation from the department? Uh, not so much yet, but I think we should seek one officially. Uh, and out of that, I would seek the agreement of the members to ask the department to urgently provide a full explanation outlining why cabinet office guidance was not followed and why, regardless of Cabinet Office guidance, the Committee was not furnished with important information that was issued to stakeholders uh, more than six weeks previously without having consulted or exchanged that correspondence with this Committee. Uh, also, asking for that explanation, would it be members' thoughts or views to seek agreement to schedule an oral evidence session from the Department on the common framework itself, but also to provide an explanation here at this committee, an oral explanation as to why this, the information wasn't received by the committee. Chair, did you say that the um, Cabinet Office have now moved to stage four? So, and this is stage three? We're, we're, at, we're at stage four presently. Right. Because uh, remember, this is a coordinated approach throughout the UK. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose it's to come into play for the 1st of January 2021. Mm. Uh, the clear guidance from the Cabinet Office was that the devolved legis administrations uh, should have issued the scrutiny guidance at phase three. So that's when we should have received it. Uh, that's, I think, when all the stakeholders received it. But it really was, it was, seems to be the case that if it wasn't for that third party writing to us, then we probably wouldn't have been aware of it. Mm. Uh, that in itself, I think, is is disturbing <coughs> and alarming and needs to be uh, explained. 
So I suppose I'm asking, and again, remember we're going into recess now. Mm. So I think that at the earliest opportunity, we should be seeking a written explanation. Uh, I think that we should be seeking correspondence from the department on the issue, uh, but then that we should have them in front of us to explain the framework, to give us an oral briefing uh, on the common framework, and then also to explain further the lapse in communicating with this committee, the scrutiny committee. But it will be in by then? It will be in place? Well, we probably have an opportunity next week. Oh, would we? Uh, because that will be our last meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. So, if, I think we really need to do, I think we need to hear from them as to why this, now again, anybody and everybody can make a mistake, but I think we have to understand why that happened. Are members content? Could I also uh, seek agreement to ask the department to immediately provide full details of all organisations that it issued the summary framework to and copies of all responses received, uh, so that we'll have that, and also seek agreement to forward the correspondence from CEFNA to the Committee for the Economy for its views, as that committee will have an interest in the impact of the common framework on Northern Ireland businesses seeking to secure public procurement contracts in the Republic of Ireland and to inform the Committee of the Economy and the Committee for Finance if they will keep it updated on progress. Okay. Sorry, I'll read that again. And to inform the Committee for the Economy that the Committee for Finance will keep it updated on progress. Are members agreed? Okay. okay. Moving on then, chairperson's business. There is no chairperson's business. Could I seek, uh, could I seek agreement then to move to agenda item number 14 on the SL1, the business tenancies, coronavirus restrictions on forfeiture, at rel relevant period, Northern Ireland Amendment number three, regulations 2020, uh, at item number 14. Can I inform members that the following papers are relevant to this agenda item? Clerk's briefing note tabled, tabled at page 8. The business tenancies, coronavirus restrictions on forfeiture, relevant period, Northern Ireland Amendment number 3, regulations 2020, tabled at page 11. And again, that's tabled. Can I inform members that section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 provides that a right of re-entry for forfeiture under a relevant business tenancy for non-payment of rent may not be enforced by action or otherwise during the relevant period. Relevant period is currently defined in sex, subsection 7 as the period starting with royal assent and ending with the 31st of December 2020. That end date was inserted by the business tenancies coronavirus restrictions on forfeiture relevant period in order number 2 regulations 2020, which were cleared through the committee earlier this year. This new draft rule will extend the relevant period for the purposes of Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 to the new date of the 31st of March 2021. Can I inform members that the rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedures? And can I inform members that it is proposed that the rule will come into operation as soon as possible and in tandem with provision in Britain? It will be necessary for the Department to break the 21-day rule in respect of the rule to allow ongoing harmonisation with the policy position in Britain and by necessity for business tenants to come into operation by the 31st of December 2020. Can I ask members if they have any comments on that? If there are no comments, can I seek agreement from members that if members agree that the committee has considered Department of Finance's proposals for subordinate legislation, the business tenancies, coronavirus restrictions for forfeiture, relevant period, Northern Ireland Amendment No. 3, Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Moving on then, members, to correspondence. Uh, from the Committee of Communities regarding licensing and registration of clubs amendment call a bell uh, call for evidence at page 122. Can I remind members that this matter was deferred from last week 
to wait for Matthew uh, to make a formal proposal regarding this bill. You must, you must have former, uh, you must have uh, form in this, Matthew. I, I raised it the last time, Chair. I mean, I, I, I'm going to disappoint colleagues. I don't have a formal proposal to make, but I should say that since this, um, since I did raise the issue uh, for us to discuss, it has been made clear that the committee stage of this bill is going to be extended to May. Um, so there will be a significantly longer period of time. Uh, I think last week the um, Chair Paul Bradley moved to have the committee stage extended. So there is, as it were, less there is less time pressure. Um, I will, uh, under any other business in the coming either next week or future weeks, raise a formal proposal. I do think it's important that we um, make a contribution to this debate, but I don't think it's imp important that we prioritise it right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for Thanks that. Others. Sorry for bouncing you there. No, um, happy to be bounced. It's an important uh, subject. Okay, uh, so can I seek agreement then to note? Any other members wish to make comment at this stage? Are you happy enough with what Matthew has proposed there and, and uh, happy to uh, note at this point? Okay, seek agreement to note. Yep. Further response then from the Department regarding General Register Office Letters to Churches, pages 1 to 3. Can I ask members if there are any comments? Uh, Jim Wells, you had spoke about this before. I'm happy enough to give you a moment if you want. or if you Nothing to add. Nothing to add at this stage. Okay. Can I ask members if there are any other comments then? Any other members want to come in, contribute? If not, seek agreement to note. Correspondence then from the Committee for Justice regarding the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill at page 124. Can I ask members if there are any comments? If there are no comments, my computer has just froze. Uh, can I seek agreement then to note? Okay. Uh, response from the Department regarding a number of queries requested from Land and Property Services, page 125, pack. Can I ask members if there are any comments? No. Uh, seek members' uh, agreement to note. Okay, great. Departmental response then regarding NISRA, annual report and accounts 2019 to 2020, and the red, amber, green RAG status guidance at page 150. Can I ask members if they have any comments? Seek agreement to note. Okay. Departmental response regarding VAT on goods from GB to Northern Ireland at page 152. Um, can I just say, folks, that the clerk of the Committee for the Economy has confirmed that his committee is following up this matter with DFE. Okay. Can I seek agreement then to forward the response to the Committee for the Economy to inform its ongoing work on this issue? Agreed. 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 Although I would just append to that, Chair, if I, uh, Chair, if I may, that I think um, there will be. It might be worth just saying that, you know, that this letter, it's clear from the date on it, predates what has been published today by the Cabinet Office uh, in terms of uh, protocol implementation. So there hopefully will be slightly more clarity, as in since that letter was sent. Okay. Uh, Chair, could, could I say the. The issue for car sales in relation to margin, payment of, of margin VAT, is a serious issue. It is going to probably jeopardise the survival of a number of second-hand car dealers. And my concern is that HMS, HMRC possibly see it as a win-win for them, but it's certainly a big lose-lose for the uh, car salesmen. Uh, particularly that trade where they were buying cars in GB and now will pay VAT on the entirety, even though that might have been a vehicle on which VAT was paid in the first place. Um, I think it's going to kill that trade at that side of it and um, something urgently needs to be done to help those people. Okay, any further comments? Okay, content to move on then. Uh, from the House of Lords EU Committee on the Financial Secretary to the Treasury in respect of a European Union proposal for the regulation to establish the EU Single Window Environment for Customs, CSW, tabled at page 3. 
Can I inform that's table at page three? Can I inform members that the EU Affairs Manager has been contacted by the clerk and has agreed to obtain a copy of the response from Her Majesty's Treasury for the committee's consideration? Can I ask members if they have any comments? Well, again, I think those are very pertinent issues, and I would certainly like to see the response. From the Treasury. Okay. Any further comments then? Yeah. I mean, again, I would also say that this is um, it is pertinent. Jim's right. It's also um, further to what was published today. It's important that there, that we note. Um, uh, that we basically ref that we if we're forwarding this that, that this is we need to update this basically based on what has been published today or hasn't been published today because today there answer some questions but asks others okay members then content to move on can i seek a agreement then to note pending receipt of the response yep yeah, agreed can i seek agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence on this Members have a burning desire to raise something. Okay, can I seek agreement to note the information request to the department? Can I seek, sorry, yep, agreed. Uh, can I seek agreement to note the routine papers circulated on Friday, the 4th of December 2020? Okay, as noted. Uh, can I draw members' attention to the outturn and forecast outturn analysis in, rut in routine papers? Just to draw your attention to that. Can I advise members if the committee is content that the monthly outturn and forecast outturn in routine papers in the future and the full analysis provided by RAISE on a quarterly basis? Are members content with that? Mm. Can I seek agreement to include the monthly outturn and forecast outturn in routine, routine papers? Agreed. Okay. Okay. And I advise members then that RAISE will provide the next quarterly analysis in March. Okay, for, your mem for members' consideration. So then, uh, item number 10 is for the work programme. Can I, uh, can I inform members the forward work programme for September to December is at pages 192 and the forward work programme for January to April 2021 is at page 197. Uh, can I inform members that Professor Ali Najai, I hope I've got that right, Director of Fire Safety Engineering Research and Technology in the School of the Built Environment in the University of Ulster has agreed to give oral evidence on 13th of January 2021 regarding the amendments to the building regulations Northern Ireland 2012. Okay. And can I inform members that the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, UCAS, has been approached with the request to give evidence regarding the amendments to the building regulations Northern Ireland 2012. Or that should be 2021, is it? Uh, on the 27th of January 2021, uh, although the committee office is checking if UCAS can present jointly with FireCert on the 13th of January. So just to inform members that those two uh, pieces of work are coming before us. Uh, the Department has advised that the Minister is unable to attend the committee on the 16th, and assuming the Minister makes a statement on the 15th, officials will attend on the 16th to discuss this with the committee. Are members content with that then? We will not get the minister, but we may well get the officials. Okay, can I seek agreement then that the committee is content with the draft forward work programme for September to December 2020 and from January to April 2021? Can, can I, um, Chair, if I may, just on the on in February we are due to have evidence from on the 3rd of February from NIPSA and on the 10th of February from Pivotal, the think tank on innovative drivers for and buyers to change and improvements. I have two questions. Have we, that title of that evidence session, is that something we provided it's, or is that, and is this, um, it seems a slightly strange, I'm not sure, I, I don't remember us ever seeking evidence on that slightly jargony subject matter, although we are obviously seeking evidence on the rolling basis on civil service reform and there have been specific issues, obviously the NIAO report that came out a couple of weeks ago about um, capacity and capability in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, talked about some of this stuff. But my two questions are, one, I don't remember us agreeing, and we should be taking evidence, but to this particular strand of, ev to these evidence sessions, and two, I wonder if there are other people we should be uh, inviting along. 
Yeah, I, I can't find the source. I can't think in my head where the source was of this from. The clerk will probably be able to. Uh, could we get the clerk maybe to give you a ring? Yeah, that's uh, fine. Just to inform me because uh, just there, there, be there are a couple of other people I think Keith we could take evidence from. That would be bouncing Keith today unless he has an answer off the top of his head. Sorry. So Sorry. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get we'll get Jim to give you a wee ring. Yeah, they're on. I just can't think of the source of that, whether it was a committee request or whether it was a piece of work we were going forward on or whether it was a department led thing. Yeah, okay. Would that do? That's fine. Any other questions about the forward work programme or any other any other business then we move on to? Chair, can I raise an issue? Yep. Um, I think the experience of most of us with the LPS and the various payouts has been very good. But recently there came a directive. Uh, that all such chasing of queries from constituents should go through a named official in the department. And since that happened, the turnaround has drastically lengthened. I have, well, my office today gave me a list of 40 cases that were waiting for a response on. So why is it that the direct access, as it were, to LPS has been um, shut off and we now are having to go through a named official in, in the department? You can certainly, you come in on this, on this point. One point, and I would like to endorse just what, in fact, the previous speaker said, uh, that I've experienced exactly the same thing. Yeah. I, I, I detect that I have ignored that directive and I have kept and continued to go to the, the person at the head of the organisation and I haven't received or detected any differential responses in my office but I take the point, it's a valid point and we'll have to try and get it, investigate it just to see what's happening. I, I can understand why they would issue a directive like that if there was a burden on the one person in a one position but to be honest with you it worked well the first time. Yeah. So and I don't see why it wouldn't work well this time, because the person we're all talking about, which we all know who we're talking about, is a very capable person and has coped very well to date. So again, if it's out of his hands and put into a departmental hand and it's slowed down, well then we'll need to consider what's going on. It may well be that we're just at the point where it's the more complicated cases they're dealing with, but having looked at my casework over the last week, I'm not sure that is the case yet. Uh, any other comments on this issue? Sure, I just have to say, it's not really contributing to this, but it, the person I'm dealing with in the department, I don't know if it's the same person, I just have to stand up for her and say she's actually been very good. So I don't know if we're, both, if we're all talking about the same person, but I just feel that she has been very good, and I would say two days is as long as I've had to wait. So Is that the a department official or an LPS official? No, department. Right, okay, well that's, a, yeah. that's good to know too, also, that there's somebody there that's... Uh, doing good work. Okay, we'll try and get to the bottom of it. I think that's mm. because it's it's an issue that we'll all be facing, but not only all of us in this committee, but every M MLA. Uh, we have just privileged access to to that line of uh, department. Any other member want to bring any further business? Mr. Chairman, I note that under your stewardship, the committee's lasted half the time. <laughs> Could I just make a formal proposal in the absence of that you remain in the position for the rest of the, uh, of the term of the Well, <laughs> since I can't make the next week's committee, I'll, I'll take that to the end of the year. Would that do? <laughs> okay, members, moving on then. Uh, remember, please, once we go to closed session, there is another uh, item agenda. but. The date and time of next meeting, then item number 12. Uh, next meeting is on Wednesday, the 16th of December 2020, at 2 p.m. in the Senate Chamber. I will have to exclude myself. I have two appeals, which I'm glad they can say have started again in the Bellamine area. Mm. Two PIP appeals. Do what? Um, Why did you do that? Well, I gave, I gave the Minister in the House a lot of bad manners one day, and to be fair on the Minister, she has came good for me. So. Uh, the Department of, of Minister of Communities, of course. So that's a, that's a good thing. And I have two appeals next Wednesday afternoon, so I won't be able to make this uh, uh, meeting next week. Are members content then? Okay. Can I inform the meeting then that we will move into closed session? Okay. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.